Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to Joao and the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today about cholesteatoma surgery results and how this might guide our best practice. Now, when we're talking about results, I really wanted to highlight one specific area to narrow down the question for you. And we're going to be looking specifically at recidivism or residual disease, which is disease left behind by the surgeon or recurrent disease that reforms. And when we're thinking about recidivism, what are the factors that classically affect recidivism? Well, these are the classic ones. There is a difference between pediatric and adult phenotypes of cholesteatoma. This is well known. The site of presentation and the staging of the disease on presentation can affect recidivism. But we specifically wanted to hone in on techniques, surgical techniques of removal that might reduce residual disease and surgical techniques of reconstruction that might reduce recurrent disease. And so... For, to do this, I looked at the last 10 years of data. Now, I may have made mistakes, and I apologize at the beginning to any authors that I've left out or anyone who finds a weakness in the argument, but we're looking at high-quality data with at least five-year follow-up for cholesteatoma, presented in an appropriate staged way, and looking at the most recent presentation techniques for cholesteatoma outcomes, which is with the Kaplan-Meier curve and logistic regression. And we're looking for high-quality randomized trials, case-controlled and systematic reviews with meta-analysis. So to begin with, let's look at pediatric acquired disease. And we're focusing now our question on disease in the mesotympanum and in the attic. And if we're looking at surgical techniques, this is the first paper looking at endoscopic work in pediatric cholesteatoma isolated to this location. And this came from Professor Marchioni's group in Modena. And we can see we had a three-year mean follow-up with appropriate power in the group. And they found with lower stage disease, disease staged in the mesotympanum and in the attic, that their residual rate when they were doing it endoscopically was 19% compared to canal wall up surgery with higher residual rates, noting that the disease tended to spread into the mastoid with these cases. So that's the one issue with this paper. We have other papers here from Stephen Hoff's group looking at as well lower residual rates in specific pediatric cholesteatoma of the middle ear with a mean follow-up of 2.6 years. Now, when we're looking for more higher quality data, here's some work from Dixon and our friends in uh, Toronto, Professor Adrian James, and he used this statistical technique of propensity matching to reduce allocation bias. And when looking at limited attic cholesteatoma and middle ear disease, found that using the endoscope showed a residual rate of around 6% compared to around 10.7% with postauricular approaches, giving an absolute risk difference or reduction of 4.6% in pediatric, middle ear, and attic cholesteatoma. So if we aggregate all of this data, it seems like for middle ear and attic disease in the child, the endoscope at the moment is probably the best relative to microscopic techniques to reduce residual rates. What about with mastoids? Well, quite classically, most centers around the world will tend to stick with canal wall up surgery for children and mastoid related disease. And I found this interesting paper just published last year comparing the two techniques. Now there was a high risk of bias in all of the 17 studies, but there was a 1,300 patients and the mean follow-up was between 3.7 and 11 years and they found no difference in residual rates of cholesteatoma between canal wall up and canal wall down surgery. So this might help guide you when you're approaching mastoid disease, that if you are a endoscopic surgeon, then the combination of the endoscope in the middle ear and the endoscope in the microscope in the mastoid probably gives you similar residual rates to canal wall down surgery in the child. So if there's no canal wall erosion, then I think canal wall up surgery is the way to go for children. What about pediatric recurrence? Well, this is an interesting point, and probably the highest quality data has come just recently this year from Professor James again in Toronto. And here he made an illuminating finding. Now, this is over 400 cases of cholesteatoma prospectively gathered by one surgeon, one surgeon operating. And the take-home message here is the severity of the presentation seems to be more important than the surgical approach with regards to recurrence or disease reforming in these areas. And you can see his numbers are presented here with a five-year recurrence of around 16% and 10-year recurrence in children of 29%. And you can see with progressive staging of disease with single location disease, 11% risk of recurrence, two locations, 22%, 
and stage 3 disease up to 32%. In other words, good ears tend to do well on presentation and bad ears tend to do badly. And I think this is specific most likely to the pediatric phenotype of disease. I'm not sure we can easily translate that into the adult case. If we look at um, Adrian's results, he finds, as we expect, that the pars flaccida has the highest recurrence risk. Now let's move on to the best technique in surgery to reduce adult residual disease. Now, once again, let's focus on single stage or two stage disease in the mesotympanum and in the attics. And we're looking for surgical removal techniques that might reduce residual rates. And we have three, actually four randomized control trials that have come out in the last three years. Looking at this specific group of patients, all of the studies except for one were relatively limited in their numbers. I should say two were relatively limited in their numbers and power. And all of them suffered with the weakness of only one year or just above one year of follow-up. But here a first study presented by one of our co-speakers, Waleed. Hi, Waleed. If, uh, sorry I couldn't see you. But an excellent study showing that they found equivalent residual rates in patients with uh, endoscopic versus canal wall up and endoscopic when they were looking again at localized cholesteatoma in the attic region. They found that when they were using the canal wall up technique with the endoscope, it was a longer operating time, so they preferred the endoscopic technique. Here, a randomized control trial from India showing that the endoscopic technique might be superior for residual recurrent disease, but one, once again, um, limited follow-up time of 12 months. Here, an interesting paper just using the endoscope to inspect and then dissect, showing, and this was, of course, aggregate data as well between children and adults, and it showed with this mixed population that disease in the past tensor using the endoscope had a statistically significant better outcome in terms of residual rates, 13 to 47% when compared, and they couldn't reach statistical significance in the past flaccid, although there was a trend when using the endoscope in the middle ear and in the attic for adults, so not for dissection, but just for inspection, that um, they also had a reduction in disease, but this did not reach statistical significance. Lastly, in the randomized trials that have been published in the last few years, this well-powered study from China looking at 192 ears with stage 1b and 2 disease, so limited disease like the question we're, that we're trying to answer specifically for the mesotympanum and the attic, and they showed residual rates were the same between the two techniques. So this, the authors concluded, suggested that perhaps the endoscope is better because it's less time with the endoscope, the patient tends to have less pain, and the middle ear visibility index, an objective index to identify structures in the middle ear, was far superior with the endoscope. So this drew a conclusion for us that again, in the adult, with limited attic and mesotympanic disease, that the endoscope is probably the best option. And that's because we tend to have equivalent residual rates in this area compared to the microscope. But of course, we have better visualization, reduced operative time and pain, and likely avoiding an incision as well. So now let's look at the mastoid, and this is the age-old debate, canal wall up, canal wall down. And as I mentioned to you, most endoscopic surgeons will tend to use a canal wall up technique unless there is canal wall erosion. And I think now the argument against visualization is fading away because with the combination of canal wall up and the endoscope, we can see just as much, if not more, than the canal wall down. So in general, most surgeons will tend to start with a canal wall up technique, and the residual rates are probably going to be similar, and certainly the early evidence is suggesting that for us. Now, what about adult recurrence? Do surgical reconstruction, rate, reconstruction techniques here affect recurrence in adults? Let's have a look at the data. Some of the best data has come out of, uh, out of Bologna and Modena if we're looking at techniques to try and reduce recurrent disease. So this is work looking at historical cohort studies. And we have 55 patients that were done endoscopically with limited attic disease and 55 control patients where they uh, performed a canal wall up approach, the classic canal wall up approach, a long mean follow-up period of five years, and they showed the recurrence rate. So this is reformation of disease was statistically significantly less in the endoscopic group at 9% compared to 22% for the canal wall-up group. 
And the authors, Livio and authors, suggested that if they performed the technique endoscopically, if they recreated a ventilation pathway, so this is following the selective disventilation theory of primary isthmus obstruction that can cause attic disease, and if they preserved mucosa, this tended to cause less recurrence. The small counter-argument to this is that if we've got preserved mucosa, this implies less aggressive disease or potentially single-stage disease or less um, invasive disease, which might have clouded the results. And of course, this is a retrospective study with historical co cohort control. So this is nonetheless good data that we must consider and use when we're evaluating the best techniques. Now, in terms of surgical reconstruction techniques that have significantly demonstrated reduced recurrence rates, we can't avoid the fact that mastoid obliteration may be a good technique for us to consider. And here's some work from, uh, from Holland, from Van der Toom's group, published in JAMA. And this was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at over 1,500 patients. And this study's weakness was really the varying time points for follow-up of recurrence. So not super meaningful data, but nonetheless demonstrating that in canal wall-up or canal wall-down surgery, despite the techniques of uh, obliteration, that when we do single-stage obliteration, the residual recurrence rates tend to be lower. So if we're looking at recurrence, 4.2% in varying time points and 5.8% in canal wall down surgery. If we look at a single institution over 330 cases with a five-year follow-up presented in kaplan Meyer way, we can see the authors here, the same van der Toom group from Holland, that the bony obliteration group had a statistically significantly lower rate of, of recurrent disease, I should say, at 4.4% at five years compared to canal wall up 21% and canal wall down at 8.5%. And the important point is this heat map looking at recidivistic location for these three techniques. In other words, where does the residual recurrence disease tend to occur? And you can see in bony obliteration techniques that the highest um, the highest amount is really in the tympanum here. And I must highlight to you that these were surgeons who don't use the endoscope. And we know the endoscope's strength is in the mesotympanum. So they found most of their recidivistic disease in these areas. And with canal wall up and canal wall down, as expected, particularly canal wall down, the recurrence rates tend to occur in the cavity so if we put this all together for you in this uh, grid, the method of disease removal here with early stage disease, we would say endoscope is best, probably with cartilage reconstruction to minimize uh, retraction. And in the mastoid, with the use of the endoscope, canal wall up, probably with bony obliteration if there's aggressive disease into the mastoid. The tricky area is in the attic. And what do we do in the attic? And this is the final slide for you to finish here. And we know the endoscope is the way to go in the middle ear. We know that the canal with the canal wall up mastoid surgery and the use of the endoscope that possibly with bony obliteration, this is the way to go in the mastoid. But what about in the attic? And in the attic, I think we need to look at the phenotype of the disease and the phenotype of the mastoid. And if we've got encapsulated, definitively visualized disease, then I think the way Professor Prasuti recommended with removal of the disease and primary reconstruction of the attic is the way to go. And if we have infiltrative inflammatory disease in this area, which is adhesive, and we're dissecting with the endoscope and it's not coming out neatly, then probably minimal adicotomy and come from behind using the endoscope and the mastoidectomy and consider bony obliteration techniques to try and reduce uh, recidivism in that area. So I hope you enjoyed that short tour of the high quality evidence that's available and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks so much once again.